right, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and stand up in the house of God this morning. I hope you've come excited to the house of the Lord, that you've come with an expecting heart this morning because we believe the Lord's going to be here. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I don't know. I, I thought I was talking to a church that was in revival for a second, so I thought I, I thought we would expect the Lord to be here a little bit. Amen. All right. Just go ahead and lift our hands to heaven right now. Just begin to speak the name of Jesus. Begin to praise his holy name because he is worthy. Let's begin to set the atmosphere right now because he is worthy. Listen, let me tell you something about thermometers and thermostats real quick. Thermometers tell you what the temperature of a room is, but a thermostat sets it, all right? And so we need to be thermostats today. Begin to praise the Lord and set the atmosphere in his house, okay? So let's just begin to speak his name right where you are. Lord, we come before you right now this morning just crying out to you because you are worthy. You are holy. There's none beside you. And so we just begin to speak your name because there is no one else we can call upon. Have your way this morning. We believe for salvation this morning. We believe for healing in your house today. And we know you're going to do a mighty work. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise and a shout of glory today. I don't know about you, but I came to give him all the glory this morning. Come on, church. Pour out your hearts before him right here. Search the world. It couldn't fill me. There's empty praise, treasures that fail are never enough. You came along. Hey, there's nothing better 
right there. Won't you give him praise in this room? Come on, our best worship. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
we just lift our hands all over the building. Just lift our hands to heaven right here. If you need to move the Lord in your life right now, that would be the, the nice, it'd be the right time. It'd be the right time to have it. Amen. While the waters are troubled in this place, while the Holy Spirit is moving in this place, can we just say, Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we know that you're the chain breaker. Jesus, we, we realize, God, that you can make all things new. Jesus, we realize that you can take where we are right now in this miry clay and you can set us on a firm foundation. Jesus, we need you this morning. Holy Spirit, move in our lives this morning. Father, we need a breakthrough, and we know that the spirit of the breaker is in this house this morning. Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for the move of your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, go ahead. Sister Jack is, it's got cancer in her lungs. She's not doing good. And I've been staying with her and help feed her and everything. But you know, sometimes the Lord gets hard and you get scared. And, and I, I've seen death. I've seen death come in the room. I've seen death leave. I've seen it all. You know, I've had a lot in my family. But I just want to give God praise and ask y'all to, when you ain't got nothing to do, say a prayer for Jackie. She's a Christian. And she thanks God every morning when she gets up and walks. And. Uh, and, uh, and pray for me to have the strength to help her because God knows that's my heart and I love every one of you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated in the house, seated in the house of the Lord this morning. It's so good, so good to see everybody out here for our 11 a.m. service this morning. Had a good crowd for the 9 a.m. And I'm telling you, he, Brother Mike preached the house down this morning. And uh, so, uh, I, you know, it's, it's always better for the 11 o'clock because, you know, the 11 o'clock, man, you guys look good. Uh, you, you guys do. We don't say that to the 9 o'clock, all right? We only say it to the 11 o'clock. Don't ask them about that, okay? So uh, you guys look amazing. And so welcome to Freedom Worship Church. So glad that you're with us this morning. we got some visitors that are visiting with us uh, for the first time or first few times. Freedom, well, uh, Freedom Worship, make them feel welcome this morning. We are so glad that you're here with us. If you don't have a home church, we'd love for you to make Freedom Worship your home church. A couple of announcements that we have uh, while our brothers are, are actually, let's go ahead and receive our offering. I'll give you the announcements while they're, they're uh, receiving the offering. Uh, but if you're giving this morning, the easiest way to give is Easy Tithe. Uh, and we're also going to pass the bags around if you have a check or, or, or a cash gift. If you're watching online, we have several people that mail gifts in. You can uh, mail that to P.O. Box 386 in Norton, Virginia. If you're sending in, that's coming across your bottom of your screen right now. We want to thank everyone who's watching us at home. Uh, I know that we got people that don't even live in this region, that this is our, their, their home church because they're shut in, but they watch us here at Freedom Worship Church, and so we're glad about that. Let's pray over this offering this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you, Jesus, that we have the opportunity opportunity to give. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to give into your kingdom. Father, we believe this morning that the, the offering we're receiving is going to lift people up. It's going to preach your gospel and, uh, to, to every living creature. God, we believe that missionaries are going to be encouraged because of this gift. We believe people's families are going to be strengthened and comforted because of this gift. 
Father, we're not looking for, we're, we're not just looking for a, fi- we're not looking for a financial blessing in return. We want a spiritual harvest in return for our giving. Let lives be changed and souls be cha- uh, saved as a result of our giving this morning. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, amen. It's a privilege to give this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements to pass your way uh, while we're uh, receiving our offering. Um, we're, let's, well, they're waving at me. Let's go ahead and, re- and dismiss our children right now. You can tell I don't do offering and announcements much. Give our, our kids a big hand clap of appreciation. All right. Yeah. Many must be good back there. They're running to get back there. <laughs> I didn't see a single person running to get in this sanctuary this morning. They must, got, they must have the secret back there in the children's ministry. There wasn't anybody running to get in the front door. <laughs> Amen. We love our kids. Um, we do have a revival coming up. Uh, actually, we, we, we've been in revival for the last uh, week or so. We've had a spirit of revival for a while now. But we're starting revival again tonight. We're going to be in revival from tonight through Tuesday. So tonight at 6 o'clock, tomorrow and Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And so come back and join us. We've been having a packed house every night. We want you to be here. If you know somebody that needs to be here, then uh, make sure you invite them. Go and get them. I heard uh, Pastor J.R. Vipperman one time. I was down at his place. He was encouraging his congregation. He said, 100% of those people that you bring with you will come. And so go get somebody, bring them with you tonight. Going to be a wonderful time. Also, we've got a revival coming up uh, in April. That's going to be April the 13th through the 15th. Pastor Tommy Bates is going to be here with us. He's going to be here on Thursday and Friday. And then uh, Brother Jacob Moore is going to be doing a youth revival on Saturday. And so we're looking forward to that as well. And also, we got the time change that's coming up. Amen. We're getting ready to get rid of this wrong time because this is the wrong time, all right? We're getting ready to go back over on the right time uh, when the sun's not going down when you get off work. And so we're, we're excited about that. But the time changes on March the 12th. Make sure you set your clock for that, all right? And I'll, say, I'll tell you this. I've been setting my clock for this for a couple of months. Uh, I, I've, I called uh, Pastor Mike up. He's my brother from the same mother, all right? Uh, but uh, he, he's my brother. I called him up a couple of months ago, and I said, well, you, would, would you come for us on a Sunday morning? Because he pastors a church, and he's like, because uh, he's from this church. I told him it's about our 90-year anniversary. If you didn't know it, we are 90 years old as a church now, 1933 to current, and uh, we, don't, we don't look bad for 90, do we? Amen. You don't see all the wrinkles and everything. We've kept ourselves up pretty good for 90 years old. And so I asked him, could you come back and be a part of the celebration we're doing for the, for the entire year of 2023? And he said, I would love to come and be a part of both services. And so we appreciate that. I've been telling people he's the best preacher in the world. And somebody told me, and this is no joke, somebody said, well, you're, you're, just, you're, you're a, little, a little bit biased. And I said, I'm not a little bit biased. I'm a lot biased. <laughs> I'm a whole lot biased. He's the best preacher in the world, and he's coming to preach for us this morning. So help me in welcoming my brother, Pastor Mike Addison. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Thank you for coming out this sunny, uh, <laughs> rainy Sunday morning. And uh, I, I really appreciate you being here and, and taking that time. What, a, what an honor it is for me to, to be a part of this 90th anniversary uh, celebration. First thing I want to do is give honor to uh, uh, Pastor Scott and Ashley and the work that they're doing here. Hey Amen. Can we give them a, a big hand of appreciation? We appreciate them. Also, Pastor Rob and Kelly, I always get nervous uh, preaching in front of Pastor Rob. He's, he's forgot more than the Bible than, I, than I'll probably ever know. And um, Anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's always nerve-wracking to, to preach in front of him. And it's also uh, good to see uh, Doc and Sid over here. I just love them so much. And uh, just thank you all for being here. And all the friends and everybody that, um, that I was able to greet and meet before. And just, you know, this is my home church. This is where I grew up. Um, this is really what I know, and uh, Sherry Barnett and I were talking before service that, you know, this is just what we, this is just what we do, you know, this is not like um, something that's out of the, the ordinary, this is, this is who we are, but uh, before I begin, I'll, I'll, I'll share, a, I'll share a, uh, just one story, uh, of course, we were raised in this church, and then for a long time, we lived by the church up on the hill, and um, Pastor Sturgill, he would call on Saturdays, and um, he would, about 7 o'clock, and he'd say, Sister Janice, 
I thought I'd let the boys sleep in a little bit. It's 7 o'clock on Saturday. We, we, we were teenagers. And then we'd get up and we'd be mad and we'd be, we'd be like, why do we have to go over there? And, and it was time to cut grass. So we'd go over and cut grass and Pastor Sturgill loved his heart. He did not want that mower out of second gear. He said, you got to mow that grass in second gear. Now, I had four, okay? And four was the fastest. And, uh, uh, in, in, and the truth is, when he would go around the corner, we would put it up into fourth and we would take off, all right? Um, but... You know, I, I, it's, it's amazing. It's an honor to be a minister that come out of this church. I talk about this church. I talk about Pastor Sturgill often when, I, when I'm preaching. And uh, people in my area in eastern Kentucky uh, know him and, and knew of him. And, um, but I always like to tell this, this story that uh, when, when I felt God was calling me to preach, I, I, was, I was so nervous uh, to have to go and tell Pastor Sturgill that. I don't, I, I mean, I just, I was just, you know, I fought it. Like, I just did not want to tell him because I, you know, he had the bat phone, right? Like, he, he, he had that connection with God. And, and like, you know, I was afraid he's going to say, no, you're not. And, and I was, you know, I, you know, but uh, so, man, I was, I was nervous as a long tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And, and I, I, I finally got up the nerve to meet with him. And, I said, Pastor, look, I don't know how to say this. I just, I'm just going to say it. I feel like God's called me to preach. He said, I knowed it. <laughs> he said, I knowed it. And, uh, and then I was ready, right? I knew I was going to get this rhema word from God. Like I was, I was expecting tongues and interpretation and thunder and lightning and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And he looked at me and said, Brother Michael, fat preachers don't last that long. <laughs> You know, me sitting there like 300 pounds, I was sitting there going, You're right. yes, thank you, Lord, for your word. And uh, <laughs> that's, no, it's the first thing he said. And then, and then I, you know, I was a little confused and, you know, and I was just like, okay. And then, but the next thing he said is really what changed my life. And he said, Brother Michael, grow down as fast as you grow up. Grow down as fast as you grow up. He said, if you'll stay humble, then God will use you. And I found that to be true in my life. So good to have my girlfriend here today. 29 years we've been dating. And um, uh, this coming June, we will celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary this coming uh, June. And I've always said, we've said this for years, ain't we? We said on our 25th anniversary uh, that we're going to go to Hawaii, and, and that's where we're going. We're going to renew our vows on one of them islands over there. And uh, on 35 years, I'm going to go back and get her. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you have your Bibles today. Turn to, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Amen. Thank God for revival. Thank God that he, it, there's little, and you can't call revival little, but there's pockets of revival that's just... Uh, popping up everywhere. You've been seeing what God is doing at Asbury College. Um, I think over 600, uh, 600 hours that prayer revival uh, was going. and We're seeing it at Lee University. And, uh, and I was told last night, we had a meeting at uh, the Church of God last night in our region, and they said there's 180 college campuses right now that, that there's prayer going on in those college campuses. So we just give God praise for that. It's moved to Texas A&M, is my understanding, and Baylor, and then Harvard and Yale, and a lot of these colleges that were started as seminary, it just seems as though God is moving like that, and revival is just, just popping up everywhere, and uh, we just thank God for what uh, He is doing around the world. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, if you have your Bible this morning, I want to talk about our Lord Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. The Lord Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Hebrews 12 and 15, it'll be on the screen if you need it. This is from the New American Standard. It says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. 
For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words and the sound of such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them for they could not cope with the command if even an animal touches this mountain it shall be stoned. And it was so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I'm terrified and I am trembling. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Amen. Can we make this declaration together? Will you say it out loud with me? Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. For a few moments this morning, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. The year was 64 A.D. and Rome is burning. There was a madman that was an emperor of Rome by the name of Nero. He was a maniac. He had, he had lost it completely. Some historical accounts say that as Rome was burning, Nero sat there with a violin and played as Rome was burning to the ground. He had to find, this was politically bad for him, and he had to find someone to blame this on, and so he blamed it on the Christians. He blamed it on this new upstart religion whose, whose leader had been crucified on a cross uh, years before that, and he blamed it upon the Christian. They became the scapegoats. There was mass persecution that was going on in the Rome Empire, Roman Empire of Christians. Christians were being thrown into the Colosseum. They were being eaten by wild animals. They were being martyred. They were being killed. And, and there was um, obviously a, a concern in the church because people who, were, who had come to Christ uh, were being killed because of their faith. And here, what, what I believe the Apostle Paul writing, uh, you, write, you read five commentaries, you're going to get five different opinions on who wrote Hebrews, but I, I preach it as the Apostle Paul, and when you preach, you, you preach it your way. But, but here, the Apostle begins to encourage the faith of these believers in the book of Hebrews. They had, they had become converts of, from Judaism, and they had become fully devoted followers of Jesus, but the time was so critical that they were questioning their faith because they no doubt had friends and family members, acquaintances, or at least heard stories of Christians being persecuted. So they were starting to doubt, do, what, what, do, is what we believe right? There was, a, there was a sect actually around the, the Qumran area that had began uh, even worshiping angels, trying to put uh, Michael, the arch, archangel, as, a, as a, uh, uh, an object to be worshipped. And so they were trying to, to pull these believers away from what they know was true. And how, you, how would you and I feel? What if, what if that kind of persecution was happening in Wise County and, and Christians were being persecuted and thrown into coliseums and, and, and being martyred for their faith? And you knew by you simply being here today that would put a target on your back. How, how would you feel? Would you, would you have the courage to come to church? Would you, would you have the courage to assemble together knowing that you were being targeted and it could cost you your life? You started having second thoughts about, well, is, is this what I really believe or what does what I really believe, is it true? And that's what they were doing here. These believers were having second thoughts. Now, we can't be too hard on them because when you go to John the Baptist, John the Baptist was present when our Lord was, was baptized and, and, and water baptized. He heard the voice from heaven say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He saw the Holy Spirit descend upon our Lord in the form of a dove. But when John the Baptist's life was on the line, when his head was on the chopping block, he sent and said, are you you the one or should we wait for another? Even John the Baptist had second thoughts about the Savior. 
And here, the, these believers in the book of Hebrews, they were having second thoughts. Is this what we really believe? Is this really true? Is this really worth dying for? Is this, is this really um, what I want to give my life for? So Paul sends this letter as a letter of encouragement to tell them that what you believe is true. Don't turn loose of what you know to be true. Don't turn loose of this faith. And in your homework is to start at the beginning of this letter and, and read all its 13 chapters. It won't take you a long time, but your, your homework is to read through it. He starts, he just, he does a, a master's class in expository preaching as he draws a correlation with Old Testament characters and, and what we now know to be New Testament truths. And he starts bringing out that, you know, we, we, we have a, a, a better covenant with, you know, we have a better temple now. Hallelujah. The, we have a better high priest that's after the order of Melchizedek and, and, and he's pointing everything toward the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross and he's, he's telling them through those first 11 chapters, he's telling them that don't give up on your faith. Now's not the time to give in. Now's not the time to turn loose of what you believe and even though you're under great persecution and even though a lot of people are, 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 are targeting you, don't give up on what you believe because what you believe is true. But now in, in chapter 12, the tone and tenor of the letter changes and it intensifies. He, he turns it up a little bit and he, he starts telling them that, you know, he's been kind of nice up to this point. He's been very theologically sound up to this point. But, but this is kind of the way we say up in the holler, this is where the rubber meets the road. Anybody know what I'm talking about in here? And in verse 15, he says this. He says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Now in context, this is different than Romans 3.23 that says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But this is a different context. In the Greek here, this actually means that don't be lagging behind. Don't, 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 don't be lagging behind the group. It's a, the, the connotation is that there's a caravan that's going somewhere. There's a, there's a group of people going somewhere and it says don't be lagging behind. Now in those days, taking a pilgrimage would have been uh, normal for families. They would travel in large groups and, and if someone got away from the group there was a couple of things that happened. One, it wasn't safe. There could be thieves or robbers or, or anybody that could uh, try to harm somebody that got away from the group and, and the second thing is that, that it, it holds the whole group back. Like if you don't, if they're always waiting on you, then you, then you hold the whole group back. Anybody here raise kids? Amen. You know, come on let's go. Let's get, get up. You know, amen. They spend the whole, you know, 15 years telling kids that. Well, actually 21, I, I tell them that now. But anyway, uh, so anyway, that's what was going on. And what he is telling them is, hey, look, don't you be lagging in your faith. Now, now's not the time to lag in what you believe. It's time to get with the program is what he's telling you. That yes, times are bad. And yes, persecution is coming. And yes, there's bad things that's coming upon the world. Uh, but uh, what you have is the truth. Uh, and the world needs to hear that truth. Uh, and you need to get with the program. Is that true in 2023? Yes, the world is bad. Yes, there's persecution. Yes, there's bad things. But the church of the living God must get with the program. We cannot be lagging behind. Oh, give the Lord some praise. He said that no root of bitterness spring up causing trouble and by it many become defiled. In Deuteronomy, it talks about a root that sprang up that was poisonous. And it's perhaps a, 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 a connection to that, even though it's not stated directly. Perhaps it was a connection to that. But this is different in other places where Paul would talk about the root of bitterness that would grow on the inside. With this one, he said, this one springs up. It sprouts. And it's poisonous. And when that poison gets out there, that, that it can devi defile and cause trouble. So he, he, he teaches a leadership lesson here. And he says, if you see these poisonous, toxic things pop up, you got to handle them quick. You got you to cut them down quickly. You got to get rid of them because if somebody runs into that, if somebody gets involved in that, then, then, then you know, it's going to poison uh, uh, the group. So the caravan, we got to be together. Come on, somebody. Uh, the, the strength of the pack is the wolf and the strength of the wolf is the pack. We got to stay together. Amen. We need one another. And when we see these roots, these poisonous 
roots popping up here, we got to take care of them because if not, it can affect the group. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody walk into church and meet somebody that looks like they've been weaned on a dill pickle? You, you walk in there and you say, hey, good morning, how are you doing? Oh, you know how they get that infraction in their throat. Oh, Brother Michael, the devil's fit me all week long, amen. You know, and, 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 I've even heard them say crazy things. They get up there and say, you know that old devil, bless his name. And, and, you know, I mean, anyway, they, they don't realize what they're saying. But anyway, but, but, but what happens is you got to cut that off right there. And, and you know, especially when people in church, they go around try to cause divisions and tumult and you know they're in there they don't they, they like Goldilocks Christians you know what I'm talking about the music's too loud and the music's too soft and the seats are too uh, we want seats and chairs or no we want pews and and some wants the red back hymn and some wants the screen and some wants hill songs and some wants mountain songs come on you mean you know what I'm talking about and and and, and it's it's always you know I, me and me and me and me but let me let me just say this I'm the evangelist I'm leaving here today I'm blow in blow up and then I'm blowing out amen but let me say this okay uh, this is not about us this is not about you and I this, we didn't come here today uh, for one another we came here together to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that he would be praised and glorified in this house uh, I don't need a seat uh, I don't need a pew uh, you don't have to have all these things aesthetics for me I don't need laser beams skinny jeans fog machines uh, I don't need any of those things uh, oh take this whole world uh, but give me Jesus hallelujah then he says something fascinating he says that there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal now what's Esau got to do with this and how come he identified Esau as somebody who was sexually immoral. Because if you go back and you read the narrative about Esau in Genesis 25, you will see that his problem wasn't that he was sexually immoral, it was that he was hungry. And the Bible says that he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup because he was hungry. But here, the apostle is saying that same hunger and desire that Esau had for that bowl of soup is the same hunger and desire someone in this church, uh, you're not talking about this, but the one in Hebrews, in this church had to be sexually immoral. It's the same hunger, it's that same, it's that same desire. And he says Esau traded his birthright for a single meal. He, 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 he traded it for something little. He traded it for something insignificant. And what happens is when evangelists come in sometimes, they always preach on what they think is the big sins, you know, all the big ones. And we know what they're talking about. We can talk about all the big sins, uh, but I've been pastoring long enough now to tell you that a lot of times it's the little things uh, that so easily throws us off the path. It's little things that, it's the little foxes that spoils the vine. For Esau it was a little meal that he, it was a little bowl of soup but it cost him his birthright. For Adam and Eve it was a one piece of fruit. The whole garden was full of fruit but it was one piece of fruit that cost them uh, uh, their, their relationship with God in the Garden of Eden. It was the little thing that was, that was affecting their lives. Let me ask you this. What is worth trading your birthright right for? What little thing is worth trading your birthright? Is it is it texting somebody that's not your husband and wife or wife? Is that is that worth it? Is it is it is it being on a social media platform where you're in, uh, intermingling with someone that's not your husband and wife? Is it worth it to lose your marriage and your family and your kids? Is it is it pornography? What is it? What is it that is that that's causing that 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 what might seem like a little thing? 
Because here's what I learned a long time ago. That you can drink as much as you can drink. But their problems are still at the bottom of that bottle. You can smoke as much as you can smoke. But your problems have fog lights. Uh, you see, friend, uh, and money won't help you either. Money can buy you a house, but it can't buy you a happy home. Uh, money can buy you medicine, but it can't heal your body. Uh, money can buy you a silly posturepedic bed, but it cannot buy you a good night's sleep. Friend, Jesus, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Uh, Jesus is the mediator. He is the answer. Don't trade your birthright for anything. Oh, give the Lord some praise. And it says, afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Now, this isn't that God doesn't forgive, but it reflects the heart in which Esau had. Esau wasn't repenting because he sinned. He was repenting because he, uh, he felt bad because he lost his birthright. He wasn't repenting because he sinned. He was repenting because he was guilty. And there's a difference between guilt and contrition. There's a difference between guilt and conviction. You see, I've been pastoring long enough now I've seen men come and pray at an altar just so their wife won't leave. Cody, I might need you. I need an amen corner here. Amen. I, I, I've seen people just, they kind of, they back up to the altar like a dump truck and they want to dump everything there because they feel bad. Not, 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 not because they recognize their sin and they want to repent of it and they want to walk away from it. I've seen people come to an altar because they got caught and they come in there and cried with tears but, but, but only because they got caught, not because they wanted to make Jesus the Lord of their life. Oh, I'm preaching now. Yeah, I'm preaching now. The Bible says he sought it with tears, but there was no repentance there because his repentance was selfish. It was about him and his birthright. Friend, when you come to this altar and you give your heart to Christ, it is about Christ alone, the Lord of glory. He gave his life for us, so we give our life to him. Hallelujah. Give the Lord some praise. And then he moves on. He uses another um, correlation here. You can see those in, in the next, in Hebrews uh, 12 and 18. He says, For you've not come to a mountain that can be touched. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched. You have not come. Everyone say not. You have not come. To a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire and the darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of the words and the sound was such that those that heard it, they begged that it would stop and, and for they could not cope with the command that even an animal couldn't touch it and it was so terrible it was the sight that Moses said, I'm terrified and trembling. Man, can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine being at Mount Sinai when the mountain was shaken and there was thunder and lightning and, and there was darkness and you hear the voice of God? I don't know exactly what it was like, but I did see the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and Yule Brenner. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? And I remember when Charlton Heston was on that mountain and you heard that, that voice, thou shalt not kill. You know, everything was shaken and everything. Can you imagine being at the base of that mountain? And, you know, and, 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 this, and this new seeker just generation you know that they, 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 they no one was sitting down there going oh wow that's awesome no no one was at the bottom of that mountain going whoa look at those lights no, 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 no one was doing that, right? It's not like the fireworks at the Magic Kingdom where everybody was sitting there going, oh ooh ah no 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 they were terrified 
They were scared. They were, fear, they were fearful because God Almighty had come down on that mountain and it was shaking and, and the voice of God was being heard and they were covering up their ears saying, please don't let him talk no more. We, we can't hear it anymore. And Moses himself was trembling in the middle of this moment. I mean, it was sheer terror because God had come down. We see it in Deuteronomy 5 and 22, it says, These words the Lord spoke to your whole assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire, from the cloud, and from the thick darkness, in a great voice. And he added nothing more. He wrote them on tablets of stone. And he gave them, hallelujah, he gave them to me. And look what verse 15 says. If you keep going, in Deuteronomy 9 and 15, it says, So I turned, this is Moses, So I turned and come down from the mountain while the mountain was burning with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I saw that you had indeed sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourself the cast metal image of a calf, and you had quickly turned aside from the way of the Lord had commanded. From, verse five, from chapter 5 to chapter 9, they had already lost that Sinai experience. They were so terrified at the voice of God in, verse, in chapter 5. By the time they get to chapter 9, they'd already built them a golden calf. Oh, that would never happen today, though, would it? Today, no one would have this incredible experience with God and then 30 days later just, you know, lose out on it, would they? Hmm. Hmm. But I, 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 I know I'm preaching hard right here, but I'm getting ready to pour in the oil, but I want you to watch this. What the apostle is saying this, there's little things, there's little things that's preventing you from doing what God has called you to do. There's little things that's keeping you out of prayer. There's little things that's keeping you out of church. There's little things that's keeping you out of a right relationship with God. There's little things that are just hindering you. But if you think about it, you're not going to be able to square those things up at the judgment seat. You're not going to be able to go to the judgment seat and say, you know what, I... I don't go to church anymore because when I went, you know, Pastor Scott, he didn't, he didn't shake my hand. You're not going to be able to square that up at the judgment seat. You're not going to be able to say, well, you know what? My cousins, brothers, nephews, uncles, twice removed roommate, uh, they had a funeral and nobody fixed beans for them. So I'm not going back to church anymore. They moved the piano five inches. I'm not going back to church anymore. What is that going to sound like at the judgment seat? Because our Lord, he's going to be like, wait a second. I carried a 200-pound crossbar 500 yards up the Via Della Rosa to the top of Mount Calvary, and I hung suspended between heaven and earth for your sin and the sin of the world. Those kind of excuses are not going to fly at the judgment seat. Little thing. Little things. Most evangelists, they preach on the big things. And, and, and church people sit in them pews and go, oh, you know what, that's not me. <laughs> Bless God. I'm not doing that. At least I'm not like them. No, no, little things. I know people right now, they have hurt feelings over something and they've not walked back into church in years because they got hurt. People right now, unforgiveness and bitterness that they carry around with them and they can't worship because that poison has gotten on the inside of them and it hinders them in worship. Won't even talk to people because of something that was done to them. Oh, I hear the Holy Ghost telling somebody, you got to get rid of the little thing. The little thing's not worth it. That, that, that little bowl of soup's not worth it. That one apple from the one tree or the pomegranate or whatever it was, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And here's, that's what Paul is telling him. Look, yes, you're under persecution. And yes, they're killing Christians all around you. And yes, you've got an emperor that's a madman. And it may cost you your life, but stick with what you've got. It's worth it. It's the truth. It is worth it. Oh, hallelujah. All right, I'm gonna pour in the oil. Are you ready? He said, listen, 
at, at Mount Sinai, those folks were scared to death. They, they didn't even want to hear the voice of God anymore. They, they were frightened. Moses was frightened. Everyone was scared. Everybody was terrified. But look what he says. But you have now come to Mount Zion. Woo! Glory. I'm getting ready to shout in this Pentecostal church. We no longer go to Mount Sinai anymore. But now we've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem with the myriad of angels that are worshiping the living God to the general assembly church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of righteous made perfect and watch this and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant oh hallelujah you see, friend, they were terrified to be at Mount Sinai. But, friend, we don't have to be afraid because at Mount Zion, our Lord hung upon the cross. He died on that cross on Mount Zion. He made a way for you and me to approach God without fear. Oh, give the Lord some praise. Now we can walk into his presence without fear. Now we can walk into the holy place. Hallelujah. Without, without fear of hearing the voice of God. Without fear and, the, and, and, and without that fear that we have been made right with God. Hallelujah. Look what Matthew's gospel says. Matthew says, and this is a correlation to Mount Sinai. Watch this. It says, now from the sixth hour darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks split. Why, why? It, it was like Sinai. But no one wanted to approach Sinai because the wrath of God, because the law of God was being poured out on Sinai. But we can come to Mount Zion. Hallelujah. Because all of that wrath was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. He paid the price for your sin. He made a way. He took care of the big things, the little things, and everything in between. Oh, give him praise. Hallelujah. That veil was torn from top to bottom, not to let God out, but to let us in. Woo! Hallelujah. Not to let God out, but to let us in. Hallelujah. You see, we know that because of the timeline, this book was written. It was talking about the morning and evening sacrifice in Hebrews. So we know the temple was still actively functioning. It wasn't till 70 AD to, till General Titus at the time, he would eventually be Emperor Titus, who he descended upon Jerusalem and, and it fulfilled the Lord's prophecy that not one stone would be left upon another. That happened in 70 AD. This letter was written somewhere between 67 and 68 AD. So the temple was functioning and it was working. On the Day of Atonement, only one man, one time a year, a high priest, could go into that Holy of Holies. And he would go in the first time for himself and his family. Then he had to go and wash and change clothes and he'd go back a second time and it was for the sins of the people. And when the, he walked out, that's how the people knew that their sins had been atoned for because if he didn't walk out, that means he died in there. He had sin in his life. Come on. But when he walked out, they knew that their sin had been atoned for. One man, one time a year. Oh, but when our Lord Jesus Christ gave up the ghost, when he died on that cross and the veil was rent. Now it's not one man one time a year. It's not Mr. Wonderful coming for revival. It's not the latest Pentecostal preacher. Now you and I we can be standing in a parking lot at Walmart and we can call upon the name of the Lord and we can be in his presence. Woo! Now we can enter into that holy place without fear. Because the magnitude of God's wrath was poured out on Mount Zion on his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he says something else here. It's interesting. Verse 24. It says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Watch this. And to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. 
What, what, what's Abel got to do with this? So he's already talked about Esau, and then he talked about Mount Sinai, and now he brings Abel into it. Well, what in the world's Abel got to do with it? Well, I'm glad you asked. If you go to Genesis 4 and 10, it says, Then he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Now, if you're not familiar with this narrative, Cain slew Abel, the first murder in the Bible. And when that innocent blood was shed, that innocent blood was crying out for justice. Innocent blood was shed, and, and the blood of Abel was crying out for justice because there had been a terrible wrong. And it was, it was crying out, justice needs to be served. And it was actually, if you read the rest of Genesis 4, it was actually the mercies of God that put a mark on Cain that nobody could touch him because, mark, because Cain said, look, you, this, this punishment's too great for me to bear. And it was actually the mercy of God that put a mark on Cain. You see God's mercy everywhere, but it was the mercy of God. But this blood was crying out that justice must be done. Cain sinned, there must be justice. Cain did wrong, they must be justice. Somebody's got to pay for this. I grew up in this church. And I found it ironic at the 9 o'clock service, I got to speak to a lot of folks that, that are um, older, and, and they remember Scott and I when we were little. And they all talked about how mean we were. Every one of them. They came in this morning, they hugged my neck. Oh, it's so good to see you. And I was like, oh, so how you doing? And then, I, then immediately go, you know, you and Scott were the two meanest kids. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, thank you. You know, I don't know what to say. Yeah. And, and we were, you know. We, we used to, uh, there was a, an old RCA camcorder, if I remember right, that we would film the services in the old church when it was, uh, when it, when it, when it was red. And there's some of them old VHS tapes that you can hear my dad pulling us out of the church and we're screaming, Oh, God, no! Please, God, no! Because we'd get out on that carport and we'd get the business end of that mining belt. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We were, we were mean kids. I, I remember one time mom sitting at the kitchen table it's when we lived over here in the trailer park in, on Kentucky Avenue. And she sat at that kitchen table crying her eyes out. And Mamaw walks in and um, she's, Mom's crying and Mamaw says, what's wrong? And Mom was sitting there talking about how she just couldn't do anything with us. She just couldn't do nothing with us. And Mamaw was like, ah, oh, it's all right. They'll be fine, you know. We're just, just mean, just mean, mean. Well, we, you know, we grew up in church. It's the only thing we ever knew. And then, and then when tragedy came to our life, we didn't, re, I, we didn't have a lot of accountability. And boy, I tell you, Scott turned sinful. <laughs> he was a bad sinner. I mean a bad sinner. My goodness. You know, we, we, we just, I mean, I, I, can't even, I can't even tell you how bad he was. Now, myself, on the other hand, <laughs> was a lot worse. It was a lot worse. And because we went out into willful sin, we were those prodigal sons out in willful sin. Because of sin, there has to be justice. There has to be justice. That that. The, the, just, the blood just cries out. There has to be justice. Something has to, to pay the ransom. Something has to uh, abolish this. Something has to be paid. Are y'all still tracking with me? 
And all of my sin and all of your sin, all of them together, hallelujah. When the blood of Jesus, let me go back. When the blood of Jesus was shed on Mount Zion, that blood cries out and says, justice is finished. Hallelujah. Justice is finished. No, Listen, yeah, was I a bad person? Yes, I was. But thank God for grace. I'm saved, hallelujah, and on my way to heaven. My sins have been cast from the east to the west. I've come to tell you today, justice has been served at the cross. We have been made free through the cross of Calvary. Oh, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. His efficacious blood cries out. His efficacious blood cries out that justice is done. Justice is done. So as we recap, as I land this plane right here, Jesus, he's the mediator of a new covenant. That word new in the Greek actually means fresh. A fresh covenant. I'll tell a different story this time. I told one at the 9 o'clock and... I got in trouble with my girlfriend, so I'm going to tell a different story. I was talking about frozen corn at the early service, and I got a feeling I'm going to be eating a lot of frozen corn for a a long time. Yeah. I'm going to tell a different story this time. I brought a group of boys one time back here to, to Norton when I was living in northern Kentucky. And we went to Memaw's house, and I asked Memaw to cook. And the only time she'd cook is when I come home. Yeah, I was Memaw's baby. And she'd only cook when I'd come home. And she made that meatloaf, love her heart. She wouldn't drain the grease off the meatloaf. She just let it float right there. And she'd make mashed potatoes that had butter. Flo- I know it's 12.09. It's okay. I know you're hungry. We're, we're getting out of here. Just say. I know what time it is. They'd be butter floating in them mashed potatoes. You know, the way God designed it. <laughs> Listen, he said we can't live by bread alone. I've taken that word and I stand on it, all right? We need bacon and eggs and biscuits and gravy. We just, you know, all right. And I took these boys, you know, they, they, you know, youth is wasted on the young. You know what I'm talking about. It's just, and I brought these boys and they sat around the table and man, I just kept eating and them boys were like pushing their spoon and fork around and trying to make it like it was, you know, or they were eating something. And I was getting more upset because I felt like they were disrespecting my grandmother's ability to cook. So we get back in the car. And I said, boys, what do you think about that, that food? And one of them said, it's all right. <laughs> what? He said, it's all right. I said, what about the mashed potatoes? I was like, those are the best mashed potatoes in the world. And they were like, eh. And then I realized they hadn't, they had never had anything except from mashed potatoes that's been poured out of a box. It looks like oatmeal. <laughs> Which is against the Geneva Convention, I'm pretty sure. But, but we, we, there's not a bit of God in, 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 in mashed potatoes that, that you pour out of a box and mix with, I don't know, milk, water, whatever in the world it is. There's not a bit of God in that. <laughs> God wants your mashed potatoes to look back at you when you're making them. They got eyes, all right? Everybody tracking, right? They got eyes, all right? So everybody's tracking. Look, that's the way God meant it. But here was the thing. 
They had been raised on the fake, so when they put the real in their mouth, they did not even recognize it. And we got a church world right now that they have been so gluttonized by the fake, they can't pray the glory of God anymore, so they gotta bring in a fog machine. They gotta try to use oratory skills and tricks, but friend, we have a mediator of a fresh covenant, a new covenant. His name is Jesus Christ. Hey, look, there's nothing like digging up those fresh potatoes out of the garden. You may know what I'm talking about. There's nothing like digging up them fresh potatoes and making that fresh mashed potatoes. Amen, with a half a pound of butter to the glory of God. Fresh. It's a fresh covenant. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means I'm getting older. Scott's getting a lot older. I'm, I'm overweight, partially balding. Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis. Sometimes my back hurts. I got all these problems. I'm getting older, and I'm, and I'm just, I'm just kind of, you know, breaking down. I, I know I sound like them, the, some of the old timers. You know, life's evening sun setting on me. You know, all them kind of things. But, but, but. I'm getting older and losing a little bit of steam. I can't, I can't do all the things that I used to do, you know. Uh, there was a time I had already jumped over this pulpit twice already. But there's just some of them things that you, that you can't do. And I'm getting older. But can I tell you, that covenant has not lost its freshness. It's not lost its power. It's not lost its vigor. It's not le- lost its effectiveness. Uh, no, it is a new covenant. Hallelujah. It is a fresh covenant. Yes, there's a fentanyl crisis. But we have a fresh covenant yes there is depression but we have a fresh covenant the Lord Jesus Christ uh, the mediator of the new covenant oh give the Lord one more hand clap of praise someone will come to the piano what's the little thing that's keeping you from Mount Zion What's the little thing that's keeping you from Mount Zion? All of us could talk about the big things, but in my pastoral experience, that ain't usually the masses. It's little things. What's the little thing that keeps you from praying? What's the little thing that keeps you from attending church? What's the little thing that's affecting your ability to worship? What's, the, what's that little thing? that For Esau, it was a bowl of soup. It seemed so insignificant, but he lost his birthright. What's the thing that no one else knows about, not even your spouse? I believe the Holy Ghost is talking to somebody and saying and warning you and letting you know it's time to get rid of that little thing. Because it never stays that way. It grows, it metastasizes, it becomes bigger. Is it, is it worth losing your marriage? Is it worth losing your family? Is it, is it worth it? Is it worth missing heaven? Is it worth it? A little thing. If we had the ability to go and ask Adam and Eve right now if it was worth it, they would say no. If we had the ability to go and ask Esau if it was worth it, he would say no. If we went to Achan and asked him, was it worth putting all that in your tent and hiding it in your tent, he would say no. It's not worth it. And that's what Paul was telling these believers in the book of Hebrews. You got the truth. You know the truth. And yes, there's persecution all around you. And there's nothing worth giving up your birthright. There's nothing worth forfeiting your salvation. There's nothing worth it.
because here's the good thing. Here's the good news. I'm not asking you to come to Mount Sinai this morning. I'm not asking you to come to Mount Sinai. Because no matter how good you were, you still couldn't keep that law. Right? When the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, it doesn't matter if you're on the top of a a black mountain over there in Kentucky or if you're over in Bowling Green where there's the deepest deep mine uh, in the United States in Bowling Green. Whether you're at the bottom of that mine or the top of Black Mountain, it don't matter. You're still short. You're still short of the sun. You're still short. It don't matter. I'm not asking you to come to Mount Sinai. No, I'm asking you to come to Mount Zion. Because at Mount Zion, there is love and mercy. And there is grace. At Mount Zion, there is atonement for your sin. At Mount Zion, there is a, that your sin has been taken care of. You, you gotta repent, not because you feel bad, but because you wanna be a fully devoted follower of Jesus and give your life over to Him. Come to Mount Zion today. Come to Mount Zion. And the third part, because there's a blood talking louder than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel is saying justice must be done. But the blood of Jesus says justice has been done at the cross. What's the little thing? Stand with me today. Hallelujah. I believe we're living in a season where God is drawing. I believe we're living in that season right now. That's what's happening at Asbury. That's what's happening at Lee. That's what's happening at Texas A&M. That's what's happening at Baylor. That's what's happening at Harvard and Yale. God is drawing. God is drawing. Two Sundays ago, we had five people saved at our Sunday morning service. Last Sunday, we had six people saved at our Sunday morning service. I'm telling you, God is drawing right now. That's why this church is in revival and other churches are in revival because God is drawing. Scott said it's been crowded every night of revival. God is drawing. God, Matthew 6, or John 6, says we can't even come to God unless He draws us. God is drawing. And, and I feel God drawing in this place right now. I feel God drawing right here, right now. And, and let, me, let me disarm something real quick. This altar right here is not a bad place. It's not a bad place. We got, we got to quit preaching that. We got, to, we got to quit that the altar is the place where all the bad people go. No, 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 no. The altar is a good place. Because we're not coming down here to come to Mount Sinai. We're coming down here to Mount Zion where there's love and mercy and grace. God's drawing somebody. God's drawing somebody. God's drawing you. And here's what I promise you. If if you come out of that chair and you come down here to this altar, there's going to be loving people that's going to gather around you and they're going to pray with you because they love you. Not because they're going to judge you. Are you kidding? Who who are we to to judge anybody? I'm not preaching to you from a plane of moral superiority. No, 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 no. I'm preaching from you as someone who has been saved by God's amazing grace. That's That's one of the problems, Pastor Scott. Our our modern message, we don't make grace amazing anymore. We don't make it amazing. (laughs) But there's some people in here who knew me before the Lord rescued me. And they know there's an amazing grace. Oh, who am I talking to today? What's that little thing? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Oh, I believe the Holy Ghost is drawing you. You got 60 seconds. Starting now. Come on. Come to Mount Zion. Come to Mount Zion. Come on. I'll be the first one to meet you. I'll lay this microphone down and I'll I'll get right down there with you. Listen, I'm in this thing to win it. I'm telling you. I'm in this thing. I'm in it. I'm in it for the for the cause of Christ. Come on.
Is there somebody? Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. There we go. Come on. Come on. She broke the ice. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Is there somebody else? Some of you sisters come. Mom, come up here. I'll pray with you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Who else? Who else? Come on. 45 seconds. Come on. 45 seconds. Who else? Who else? Come on. Come to Mount Zion. Come to Mount Zion. Grace and mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come to Mount Zion. Come to Mount Zion. Oh, look at the Lord bless her. Bless her. Oh, God. Oh, God bless her. Hallelujah. 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 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Come on. We, hallelujah. Everything was paid for at the cross. He was paid for at the cross. Hallelujah. The Lord's moving on her. Hallelujah. 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 Come on. Is there somebody else? Come on. Is there somebody else? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 15 seconds. Come on. 15 seconds. Oh, God. Oh, God. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two and one. Hallelujah.
lift our hands to heaven right now and sing that. This is our, our last Sunday of the month, so we're going to receive communion. So I want, I want the, the ushers to go ahead and start serving uh, the congregation, if you would. But man, what a word this morning. What a word this morning. Amen. No, no better Sunday to want to receive the Lord's Supper than when we've just celebrated the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that we're not, we're not approaching um, Mount Sinai anymore. But we've come to, to Mount Zion. Amen. That heavenly city. Thank you, Jesus. That that veil has been rent. That we have something to celebrate this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As they're, as they're serving, as they're quickly serving. <laughs> Amen. Prompting right there. As they're quickly serving the congregation this morning. The Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth, he said the reason why that some were sick and even dying was because they received the Lord's Supper unworthily. And so he said it's for this reason that we should examine ourselves before we receive communion. So let's just do that right now all over this place. Let's just ask the Lord if there's anything in us that shouldn't be there. Lord, we want you to purge it out. Let's do that. Father, in the name of Jesus. 
Lord, as we, as we serve the rest of this congregation this morning, Father, we just pray right now. Lord, look upon us. God, you know us. You can examine us even to the depths of our heart where no one else could see. Lord, our prayers, like, like the psalmist that say, purge us with hyssop. Lord, cleanse even our inward parts, Jesus. Cleanse even those secret faults that nobody else knows about. Holy Spirit, we want to be clean. We want to be clean, Jesus. Lord, you said it was those with clean hands and a pure heart that would ascend to your holy hill. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We know that they had gathered together disciples. And the Apostle Paul tells us as a church, as the, as the New Testament church, how we should approach this. It, he said this, he said, as often as we come together, and I know this, some, some churches, they do this every week. Some, pe- pe- some churches do it a few times a year. He didn't tell us how often to do it. He said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. To remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul said, he rehearsed what happened in the book of Matthew. He said, when he, saw, when he, found, when he took the bread, he took it and he broke it and said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for your body. We thank you that you were wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon you. And by your stripes, we were healed. Because of your broken blood, of your broken body, we are, we are healed in this place this morning. We thank you for your body. Take eat of the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Apostle Paul, of course, talking about what happened in the the gospel, said he took also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. That's what we talked about this morning. The blood of Jesus we're celebrating. We're doing this. Listen, this, is, this doesn't turn into anything special. This is us acknowledging that it was because of the blood that we redeemed this morning. That's what we're doing. He said, he said this. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for your blood. Lord, we believe that there is, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Lord, we believe, Jesus, because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ, all of our sin has been cleansed. All of our sin has been washed away. We are, we are redeemed today because of the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you for your blood. Take drink of the juice today. And in the New Testament, it said when they were through that they began to sing a song together. Can we just sing a song thanking him for his blood this morning? Come on, sing that, Ashley. Come on, sing thank you for the blood one more time. Let's sing that all over this building this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. been good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Hey, we got revival service coming up tonight at six o'clock tonight. Bring somebody. Seven o'clock tomorrow and Tuesday. I'm, I'm going to be, listen, I'm going to be preaching tonight on the God that works with pieces. Amen. I can't wait to preach the word of, of, of the Lord tonight. Tell Pastor Mike what, what a privilege it was. Listen, I'm going to take him out and buy him a six-piece McNugget after, after hearing that kind of preaching this morning. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you tonight. <laughs>